Welcome, romance friends, to Confessions of a Closet Romantic, your little shame-free romantic recess where we have fun looking at the best romantic TV shows, rom-coms, movies, and books on a different theme each episode. This is Poppy, and in this episode, it's all about second chance romance and learning about our own deepest desires. I'm celebrating the second anniversary of this podcast with a two-part series on second chance romance. It's one of my favorite romantic tropes, and for me, it's not just about finding love after a separation or a breakup, but it's about having the courage to look for love, romance, sex, or connection at a later age or after relationship disappointments. I couldn't think of anyone better to help me parse through my recent re-entry into the dating world than the amazing Dr. Donna Jennings, a.k.a. Dr. J. She's a retired sex therapist and now erotic romance writer, and she has so many supportive, accepting things to say about how to explore our deepest fantasies and desires as we get older. Her weekly sexuality space on Twitter is a don't miss. So, Dr. J, today something occurred to me in your last space. We were talking about how difficult it can be to talk about our desires, and it made me think about my favorite theme for episodes, which is second chance romance or second chance love. I mean, he's kind of flabby in middle age, but I don't care. I'm flabby in middle age, no. you know? <laughs> it's funny, though, because our middle agedness is comforting and, and sexy to me. Mm. Isn't that so incredibly sad, but sort of good, too, you know? Yeah. And how difficult it can be as an older person. You know, I'm, I'm thinking over the age of 40, maybe 45. And I wonder if you have any tips for listeners who might want to embark on that new sexual journey to help them get their minds around that in a positive way. Where to begin? I have so much information that we can go into. I always look at things holistically. So I think about what's going on physically, what's going on emotionally, what's going on mentally, and what's going on spiritually. And I have people think about doing body scans. So in the moment when you're trying to decide, what do I want to do? How do I want to be seen? How do I want to be that sexual person right now? I have people like hit the pause button on life. So you make your own remote control and hit the pause button and do that. What's my thinking? What's my feeling? What's going on? We have so many scripted messages about body image, um, embarrassment, shame, you name it, it's all sitting there and we have to take it apart. And that's one of the things that I love about the idea of second chance romance, because we now have some mileage on our tires in terms of world experience. And we might be able to frame things about this vessel that we came into the world with that will feel more comfortable, make friends with it, um, that sort of thing. Oh, God. Oh. I said, Sid, look, lying down's fine, so. Pat and I had the chin doubles. I said, I can't take it in. I can't take my booze anymore, that's the thing. No. <sighs> Just whips my ass. You're much more likable these days, you know? Yeah, that's nice. Thanks. So are you. We were much too young when we were. We should have met now instead. Huh? Don't think it works like that. Why not? Why did the latest one leave you? Didn't actually. 
I left her. Hmm. How's your pet? Terrible. How's your opinions? Oh, excruciating. Hmm. Sweet dreams. Yes, and I think for myself, and I, I think I've told listeners in a recent episode, so I, I went on a few dating apps, including one kink dating app, and I've been learning a lot about myself. And one thing I realize is living with a chronic illness and being older and thinking about sexuality, there are some very specific challenges, I think, additional layers. And I'm trying to, and I don't know if this is just me making myself feel good, but you tell me, Dr. J, but I'm trying to focus on the gifts I still can offer somebody and try not to think about the deficits. And do you have any tips for people who might have arthritis or a chronic illness, they're getting older, and how to think about sexuality when that's a reality for them? Well, you know, sometimes I think the the way that you just described it was so excellent to stay focused on the strengths that you have, the gifts that you can bring forward. And then I think about life as accommodation. And I can tell you today, I'm sitting here in a chair with a ice pack on my back and a oh. um, seated thing underneath me. I'm having a flare in my spine. And so accommodation ends up being your friend. And in sexuality, you're thinking about where are the positions that I can get into that will be comfortable. Uh, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about doing the discussion, the Netflix uh, series on how to build a sex room, because one of the issues that they brought up is body movement and what is actual furniture that you could use that would help you in that physical direction to get into positions that will be comfortable for you in whatever activity you're involved in. I think for as we get older, I think the first part is what are we physically capable of doing? And within knowing what those limits are, starting to Think about how you can frame it differently. Maybe you're going to put more time and attention into the psychological, the banter. Listen, honey, I have to go, okay? Can I call you back? Uh, yeah, I, oh, you can. Are you okay? No, I'm fine. I'm wonderful. I, I, can I, I just need to call you back. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. You're something else. I could take a bath and how you look at me. Uh, you know, things like feathers and, and things that would make you have that playful quality come back as a starting point. And I always think about play. If people can remember that sex is adult play, for you to go back in time to your childhood, to your earliest play of any kind of play memory and bring the energy, the emotion, those things forward and see how you can translate that into what you're able to do today. Mm. That is such a great way to frame that and think about it. And also, I do sound like I'm pushing kink lately, but I'm just I'm I'm learning so much about myself from uh, friends in the kink world and delving into kinky romances. I did a whole episode on them. And one thing I'm finding with people who are in the kink lifestyle is that uh, everything is followed by the word play, right, Dr. J? So yes. it's, it's spanking is impact play or say a feather, isn't that sensation play yes, or yes. whatever, right? So the emphasis is on a, a consensual adult's playing with each other and the sense of freedom and adventurousness and acceptance of that in the kink world is so liberating for me personally that I just hope that people think beyond 50 shades, not all kink is BDSM and there's just a wide range of pleasures. And I'm so glad you brought up how to build a sex room on Netflix because that was one of my favorite of your recent spaces. And by the way, listeners, we can find that recording and I can put that in the show notes, oh, perfect. right? Yes, yes, yes. You know, yeah. you've, you hit a point, though, because I really want 
to where you're talking about the investigation of kink or you're trying to find out more about yourself, one of the things that I know from quantum model theory and sex therapy is that we look at how much do we need physically to get us to the reflex of arousal and then orgasm? And then how much do we need psychologically, you know, what's going on between our ears, all of that kind of stuff to get us to those same two points. And because we are so individual in the way that we do sexuality, those things are going to be varied and different and diverse. The coolest part for me, when I think about people stopping to investigate their sexuality is play is that when you go into the kink world, you are seeing people who are maybe a few steps ahead of you on the journey of investigation, of assessment, of evaluation, and they are really beginning to own that, the tools of consent, the tools of clarity, the tools of boundaries, so that you can voice what it is that you're interested in. And I think that's been the highlight to take a look at Um, tools that we can use to help people do assessments and investigations of what they're interested in and their desire. Yeah. And I think I, I might've said out loud in your space on that show, I have a chronic illness that makes um, some of some positions with my limbs, it would be impossible now. And I did some more research. I encourage listeners to do that, to have the courage. It's very safe to Google certain things and start looking into things. I realized from that show, oh, there's a thing called a sex chair. And not only is there a thing called a sex chair, they come at different heights because the height I would need with my disabilities might be different for uh, just an older, able, more, mostly able-bodied person. So it was a little prohibitive in price, but I found a cheaper one and I've got it in my wish list on Amazon. Oh, excellent. And, <laughs> and it was like, this is mind blowing. I never knew before watching the sex positive show that this even existed. And now after your space, which had some, let's see what in the, in the how to build a sex room space, were they, they were sex room designers as well, weren't they? Yes, it was Heather McPherson who runs Respark Therapy. Uh, she has six different locations across the United States. And uh, Respark Pleasure Rooms is the new venture that they're doing. And the cool part about that is that you've got a sex therapist who's going to be working with you on the space that you want to help you design it and do it in levels. You know, maybe you want to stay in the do it yourself mode and they'll consult with you to look at you know what's available and they were going to even have folks connections about resources and where are things available that you can get and looking at that range like you were talking about uh, price differences for it fitting the budget of um, what you you want but I think the highlight of that show for me was thinking about the idea that we all can have quality of life much higher if we integrate sexuality into our everyday life experience. And as you know, you've heard me say this a hundred times, for me, being in the sexuality space on Twitter and doing it at noon is about having a conversation about sex out there in public where everybody knows what I'm doing as a way to normalize the process, to to say it's okay to have these conversations. They We can help them be less scary. We can give you directions. We can give you resources. When you say that in the beginning, I can't tell you how lovely that feels to have you say, let's talk about this in the daylight. Uh, And I think I've shared with my listeners more than once that I'm a former Catholic schoolgirl. And so for me, getting rid of that programming in my brain that this is dirty or naughty or something that I shouldn't talk about, that conditioning was very strong. And I'm pretty proud of myself for just just kind of delving into this topic in a safe way. And this leads to my next question, Dr. J, which is, let's just say somebody is in midlife and they would love a second chance romance, a chance at another type of sex life, but they're a little scared to start researching it or to ask themselves some questions about their desire. Do you have any tips for where they might start that process? Wow, that is a spectacular question. I think aligning themselves with people 
who are sex positive so that they can see sexuality presented in a way that is different than perhaps what they grew up with, which typically, if we've not had comprehensive sexuality education, tends to have a sex negative. It's fear-based. It's all of the things that can go wrong versus the quality of life. Pleasure is something that we can all experience. Pleasure does wonderful things for our brain and makes our body feel good. Um, So following people that are sex positive and, you know, talking about writing, that's also one of the things that, that we know in creating stories that it wires our brain. And if we have all of the right things, the right senses, and we're using the tension in the right way to, you know, I have to turn the page, I have to turn the page, I have to turn the page. And you do that with sexuality, people can start to get into their mind about what fantasy has to do with and what lights their fire in their brain to get that moving. So maybe you're going to find erotica as a, you know, a resource for you. And you're going to think about um, which types of stories might be stories that are of interest. And we know um, I'm an editor for uh, Rosie, um, an app, and they are a science-based sexuality wellness platform for women. And we know from research that when a woman reads those sexy, wonderful, spicy scenes in romance novels or in erotica, that we can increase arousal, desire, lubrication, and orgasm. And that's without having to write a chemical prescription. We can give someone a book and say, here you go, try this out. It's good to just remind yourself that it's okay to have desire. It's okay to not have desire. And it's okay to feel sad about that. And it's okay to say, I don't think I want relationship anymore. But then it's okay to say, I'm not, I'm not done with that, right? I just, I, I want to figure out a way that I can re- ignite that desire or um, connect with it again. So have Dr. J, have people said that after reading your writing that they have reconnected with them? I, I have had people say that. And I've had people say, like you've expressed by being in my space, that they've given themselves permission to think about sexuality for themselves in a new way. Maybe they haven't thought that they were deserving of pleasure or desire, or to investigate to see what they really like versus what someone else may have told them they ought to like. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we had talked about how I, I like to use things out in the world to help people make those connections. And that was one of the things about the movie, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, because That was um, a menopausal woman who said, I've never had an orgasm in my life. And you know what? I think I might want to see if this is a possibility. And if you think about the layers that she went through in the movie to um, confront herself and her fears and her interests and, you know, what does it mean to be with someone younger than me who has this body and how are my chemicals working and what's going to happen Very nice. I've changed my mind again. I don't want to do it. I'm sorry to have wasted your time. I'll still pay, but you you can get a dress and go. This isn't about the Mars bar, is it? No, it's not not about the Mars bar. Do you not find me attractive? Don't be ridiculous. You're clearly aesthetically perfect and apparently nice enough. What did you picture happening? I mean, why did you book me if you don't want to do it? I don't know at this point, a moment of madness. That's all. That's all. Do you regularly have moments of madness like this? No. Do you usually make rational decisions? Yes. Well, then why would this be any different? I mean, you must have had a reason. Something that made you do it. I bet you thought about it for days before. Weeks, month, well, months, years, perhaps. Well, then it's not a moment of madness. This is what you want, Nancy. And now that you have it, why won't you take it? Why won't you take what you want when it's right here, within reach? Oh, it feels controversial suddenly. I don't find it controversial. To want something like this, even to want it. In the end, I don't want to give a spoiler, but I really love the way that it ends 
with her connection to not only the experience of orgasm, but the naked gaze is what she calls, where she can finally see her body as a body, as a vessel, without the negative baggage that went along with it. I had a former male sex worker on my episode about Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, and his main complaint about the movie, which I didn't really think about because it, it's not a perspective I have, is that in the movie, the sex worker kind of, cr- in his opinion, and I'd love to know yours, it kind of crosses the line, it blurs sex therapy and sex work. And I just wonder, Dr. J, let's just say there's somebody out there thinking, I watched that movie I'm kind of Nancy, that character. I'm I'm kind of where she is when she sort of very self-deprecatingly describes her experience as a little less than a nun's experience yeah, in the bedroom. Yeah. Okay. So if if somebody is there, how does a person figure out if what they're dealing with would maybe be better addressed with the help of a sex therapist? That's an excellent question. And, you know, I've thought about that from so many different directions, because when I began my sex therapy work in the 80s, where I was working, sex surrogates were legal. And so a sex Mm -hmm. therapist would work in conjunction with a sex surrogate for the client and um, talk about the kinds of things that would be good for the surrogate to work with physically for the client. So you're dealing with, have we merged jobs between what a surrogate is and a sex worker is? And how do we help the individual who would like the service to be able to own who they are, ask the questions that they need to ask. So it could be a two-pronged direction where you're talking with a sex therapist and you say, "Is I want to try this, I want to try that. And then you go back to the sex therapist and say, here's what happened when this went on and that went on. Yeah. We talked about the sessions, the movie with yes. Helen Hunt, and I did yes. that also in my episode on Leo Grand. And I, I can remember just watching her and thinking, couldn't everybody kind of benefit from a sex therapist slash sex surrogate? You know, like there are some things that if you just take the crapshoot of hoping to find a human partner to help you through certain things, there's some really beautiful thing about the expertise of these two professionals helping you with, especially if you've been traumatized or if you have abuse in your background, I just felt like, wow, that would be a very special experience. Imagine, yeah. And to think about having someone that you can speak with, who's going to be encouraging you about the way you talk about yourself, your interests, your wants, your desires, and they're there for you. And they're doing it in real time with the activity that you're saying you're interested in participating in. I think that's like the best of all worlds. Too soon I came, but she kept holding me inside her. Then a look of pleasure brushed lightly over her face as though an all day itch were finally being scratched. She put her hands down on the bed by my shoulders and kissed my chest. This act of affection moved me deeply. I almost wept. No one had ever done anything like that. So unexpected, so natural. Well, and also too, it's you know what I've learned from the kink world is kink, uh, consent is sexy, yes. and this is consent in the moment. Stopping and saying, "Does this feel okay to you? Is this okay if I touch you here?" Which, of course, a sex surrogate, at least Helen Hunt, as she portrayed one, was so careful with her person. She never touched any part of his body without saying, "Now, this is what I'm going to do. Is that okay with you?" May I do that? You know, it's a very beautiful thing, especially if you've had careless, thoughtless, or worse kinds of lovers. It's a really therapeutic thing to even witness in a movie or read about in a book. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, when we can get to the place that our words come out with ease, 
and they have sexual connotations to them. And it's, yes, thank you, please. And we're doing all of this in that really fun and playful thing. You think about a little kid getting all excited because they're about to be given a gift. Carry that (laughs) wonderful feeling from the past into the adult world. And look at what the gift could be for you today. Ooh, Dr. G, you're getting me going. (laughs) (laughs) So that really, honestly, if anyone's listening and they feel like I think that ship has sailed, well, it definitely hasn't. And Dr. J, my final question to you is, if you were going to talk to yourself, you know, either your past self or your current self, and try to encourage yourself to go after your desires, to live out your fantasies, what would be your top recommendation for discovering what makes you, what floats your boat, makes you extremely happy sexually? Well, I have to say by qualifying that I'm a Leo by birth, and I think everything about that has allowed me to step into any idea that I had and just try it out. But the piece of information that I would say is don't look back at anybody who's calling at you for something you should not have done, because it is all about you. It is all about being true to yourself, owning your body, owning your 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 belief about sexuality and enjoying what your body has given you and how your mind works it. Oh, I <laughs> I can't tell you what a thrill it's been to have you in my own little space. Oh, honey, this has I been do, perfect. I, I feel like you just add such a beautiful vibe. Like the way you show up is just so lovely to me. And it's so empowering to listen to you because I think a lot of us struggle with feeling worthy of these feelings and these experiences we have just talked about. And I feel like every time I interact with you, I feel like, hell yeah, I deserve this. It's a really beautiful, empowering feeling. I thank you so much for that. Oh, you are welcome. And you are so kind to let me know that I am having an impact because that's what I want. I want more people to feel good about who they are and have sexuality the way they want it. Join me next time for part two of Second Chance Romance, which will be packed with movie clips from some of the most soulful, beautiful depictions of sex, romance, and love later in life that I've ever seen. Oh, hope. If you enjoy this podcast, I hope you'll tell a friend about it. And for more information about Dr. J and what we've been talking about, visit confessionsofaclosetromantic.com. Hot Costa Rica? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad everyone is here. Until next time, wishing you all plenty of shame-free, sensual exploration.